with government formation talks slowly beginning to take shape, how did we end up with the makeup of the 34th Doyle as we did? And why did people vote the way they did? There may have been lots of talk about change, but the electorate sent back much the same. Now, to take a deeper look at this, uh, we're joined by Harry McGee, political correspondent with the Irish Times. Harry, good morning. Hi, Pat. What's your theory? Why did we end up with the same? Um, I, I think the, the reason was that uh, people looked at the alternatives that were on offer and they had difficulties with the incumbents. But I think that when they looked at it in the round and considered everything, they thought that the incumbents were probably a little bit better to take the country forward for the next five years than the alternative that was being offered. I think one of the difficulties uh, with the alternative was that it was slightly fragmented. You had Fine Gael, or you had, sorry, Sinn Féin, but then after Sinn Féin, you know, how would Sinn Féin make up the numbers uh, to have a mm. feasible and workable government? What Sinn Féin could have and perhaps should have done is much earlier, uh, at a much earlier juncture, they should have made moves uh, to other parties of the centre-left and of the left to see if they could form yeah. uh, but, some but form they, of alliance. They didn't want to give those parties a leg up, I presume, by suggesting this collective alternative. In other words, a vote for the Sock Dems or for Labour is as good as a vote for Sinn Féin. They want to make to maximise the Sinn Féin vote. Yes, but it, we, 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 the, our, our electoral system is, is complicated. So the first preferences tell you only a part of the story. It's what happens afterwards. So you see a party like the Social Democrats that didn't score hugely in terms of first preferences, but then was like a sponge in terms of picking up preferences mm. afterwards. Very late in the day, Sinn Féin, only two days before the election, Sinn Féin announced uh, that it would like people who voted for Sinn Féin uh, to transfer to the Social Democrats and people before profit. That was a two-day, that was a two-way yeah, bet. And, and yet we had uh, Richard Boyd Barrett calling for that very thing in the multi-leaders debate, the first debate. And months ago, I mean, Richard Boyd Barrett, in fairness to him, was calling for that uh, for the past uh, year. But that was a two-way bet by Sinn Féin. And when you look at the actual figures, there was a lot of transfer activity from the Social Democrats and People Before Profit to Sinn Féin, as well as from Sinn Féin to them. So, so there, was a, there was a kind of a symbiotic relationship there, Pat, in some ways, mm. that there was a mutuality of benefit uh, for, both, for all three parties. And the, 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 the net effect was that all three were able to, to get up because of that, that pact. But the, the, the problem was that when we got the numbers we did, that there was no... Uh, there was no alternative really to the two main uh, traditional parties uh, and a few odds and sods to get them into power. There was no alternative to that, no yeah. matter how you crunch the numbers. Yeah, and I think people voted for the government uh, that was in place, but without any great enthusiasm. If you look at the figures for Fianna Fáil, 22%, uh, virtually the same as they got in 2020. Uh, similarly with Fine Gael, they got 21%. That was almost the same as they got in 2020. The only change in the big three parties was Sinn Féin. They got 24.5% in 2020 and they fell to 19%, which was a significant fall uh, in 2020. But it's been touted as a victory now. They are the second highest number of seats. So if you just go on seats alone, that's um, something to be proud of yeah, and to shout the, about. But in terms of their vote, it has fallen. It has. They're, they're, they're third in the popular vote behind Fine Gael. But because their uh, candidate strategy was probably better, they had incumbency. And they were probably stronger in key constituencies. You know, I mean, the, the popular vote is nationwide. Uh, you can have a lower popular vote, but be stronger in particular regions. And Sinn Féin were a little bit stronger in particular regions. And they ended up with one extra seat than Sinn Féin net after all the hue and cry. Now, the, the, the question of uh, the smaller parties, I mean, the minority parties, if you like, the independents did not, for example, perform as well as the polls right up to the election were predicting. No, um, and they, they went in with more, they came out with more or less the same number as they went in with around 20. And uh, people were predicting that they might get as high as 30 or even north of 30 because of the churn and because of the volatility uh, that surrounded Irish politics in the run up to the election. But I think the big parties, what they did succeed in doing was steadying the ship. It looked uh, wonky for Sinn Féin for a while. Uh, because of the question of immigration and because of the series of scandals that affected it. <coughs> but it managed to to, to to write its campaign. Similarly with um, Fine Gael, very close to polling day, Fine Gael had a wobble, or what amounted to more than a wobble with the Kanturk kerfuffle, yeah. and they did manage to shore up support in the last days of Do we know whether that had any real influence on the outcome? Uh, we don't really. It's very hard to, to, to measure that. I, I think my own theory is that it kind of reflected 
a, a, a what was already a, a fall in Fine Gael support. I think the Sheen was coming off the Harris leadership. I think people were becoming a little bit uh, more sceptical about, about Fine Gael and its uh, campaign. And I think the Canturk might have confirmed it in the minds of some people and maybe just pushed them in the direction that they were probably going in any instance. So uh, the, the, the question then of government formation is fairly straightforward, isn't it? It, it is. It's become, you know, it's, it, 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 people talk about ideology and ideas and they are important, but it becomes a numbers game. And um, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are tantalisingly close uh, to the magic number of I, I see that there's talk of Sean of Real uh, retaining the role of Count Corla. Now, I, that mystifies me in a way because it means one of their own uh, indicates an extra independent needed for that majority and I don't know h- how many they need to feel really comfortable but Sean of Real becoming Count Corla means one more body at least. Y- yes, and now the, 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 the process for electing the Count Corla has changed. So uh, people nominate themselves and then it's done by a secret vote of the uh, Oireachtas. So there's nothing preventing Sean O'Farrell from presenting himself again. Now, perhaps Fianna Fáil will tell him that he can't do that and he might abide by the party whip in relation to it. But in the past, what happened was when a government or when a party was very close to a majority, what they did was they sought uh, Can Corlea from the opposite side because yeah. it gave them an extra seat, essentially, uh, or an extra vote uh, in any crucial vote. And it made the job of getting the majority all the much easier. So we've seen people... Uh, also, uh, tactically, you can be looking to the next election and seeing where you might... You, you automatically get your Count Corla returned and you might end up with effectively two extra seats. That's that's c- c- correct. So, for example, in uh, Seamus Patterson, who was a TD for Carlo Kilkenny, a Labour Party TD, became Count Corla and that gave uh, Fianna Fáil an inbuilt advantage uh, when it came to to the next election in Carlisle County in terms of securing their seats and also Labour were guaranteed a seat in the yeah. next election. So it worked out relatively well for both parties. How long do you think it's going to take? Well, I, I thought Micheál Martin, Pat, was, was surprisingly forthcoming in terms of sharing his views on government for, formation. In my experience in the past is that they've always been very reticent uh, to say the progress of talks, what their tactics are, what the bottom lines are. But already he's said that he wants it to happen quickly. He wants it to happen, uh, perhaps he said it won't happen by Christmas, but he wants to hap- it to happen in January. And surprisingly to me, he also went out and stated, you know, we have the bigger numbers and those bigger numbers must be reflected in both the composition of the government and in terms of its direction, in terms of policy. Mm. So he was sending out an early shot across the bows to Fine Gael to saying, you know, we are bigger than you, so we want that to be reflected in the composition of government. Uh, this uh, text coming in, with regard to the forthcoming debate on change, I would like to know what change means. Does it risk having the best managed economy in Europe, which drives everything? Does it risk having full employment? Does it risk having the best social welfare system in Europe? If you want proof what change does, look at France. The majority of Irish people don't want change. That's from Joe and Galway. Yeah, there's a risk aversion in, in, to be reflected in the way that mm. people voted. Of course there but is. There's a, the other question of change, um, Mary Lou Mittal kept talking about change. And when she was pushed in the debates and in interviews, how, you know, what, what's the nature of this change? There was no real answer. She didn't go big on detail. Maybe that's, you know, f- echoing the idea of Trump. You just uh, campaign in headlines, not in detail. Yeah, detail has never been her strongest suit and she tends to leave the detail in terms of policy to Pierce Doherty and to uh, Owen O'Brien. But, uh, I mean, there, there was, I mean, it would be unfair to say that Sinn Féin had not spelt out what change looked like because they had in considerable detail. Now, she didn't express it in detail during the course of that debate. But if you look at the Sinn Féin campaign uh, in, 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 in the round, there was a clear alternative being offered in terms of policy. Housing policy was markedly different from that that was being offered by Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil uh, and also in terms of economic policy, in terms mm. of state spending and in terms of the use of the so-called the, the Apple money and the rainy day funds and all the buffer uh, money that, that, that all the uh, parties want to have. Uh, more text. Imagine if only a few extra percentage of those who didn't vote came out and voted for other candidates. We'd be having a totally different discussion about government formation. We could have had real change. If the people want to vote, there's very little from stopping you and many people who live on the same road as a polling booth uh, that you pass a few times a day and didn't bother to cast their votes. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael could be down at least a dozen TDs if the others had a transfer voting plan. 
That's uh, true. The turnout was very low. It dipped beneath 60% for the first time. But I was looking through different constituencies last night and I was struck by the differences in quota between some of the constituencies in Dublin yeah. and in the country. So in a lot of Dublin constituencies, there were less than 10,000 and in some cases yeah. considerably less than like 10,000. Some people got elected without reaching the quota on less than 7,000 votes. Yes, and to me that is probably reflects a problem with the register as opposed to a problem with turnout because there were some areas that are quite affluent in Dublin, like Dublin Bay South, for example, where the quota was less than 8,000. To me, that's the gen turnout has traditionally been high in that constituency. To me, that suggested that the register there pro probably needs to be updated as now, well. We're always told that the numbers do not lie and you end up with the government of the numbers. And this texter says, between Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Greens, the outgoing government got 46% of first preferences. If we add in the so-called gene pool independents like Murphy and Lowry and Boxer, more than 50% of the first preferences in general election 24 went to the outgoing government and their supporters. In other words, yeah, well, the majority th did not want the left and they're not getting the left. Well, that's the, that, that's the, the outcome. I mean, the outcome is that the, the incumbent parties won the election, essentially, and came within two seats of having an overall majority. Uh, surely Fianna Fáil would be ideologically closer to Sinn Féin than Fine Gael. It's not so long ago that the posters read Fianna Fáil, the Republican Party. Well, that's an ongoing debate within Fianna Fáil and there are some TDs in Fianna Fáil who do think that the party is much closer ideological to Sinn Féin than it is uh, to Fine Gael and would feel more comfortable in an arrangement with Sinn Féin. But the current leadership of the party has been you know, more than adamant that no deal will be struck with Sinn Féin. And I think that you would almost have to have an Armageddon scenario uh, uh, affecting Fianna Fáil uh, before uh, Micheál Martin and those who are closest to him, the leadership, uh, would contemplate a partnership with Sinn Féin. Mary Lou Macdonald thought Sinn Féin was untouchable and would romp into power on a huge majority until reality began to set in in the latter days of the campaign. Plus people mistrust Sinn Féin's budgetary figures, plus their dark past. And while there's a lot of noise from the very vocal left, the vast majority of people are doing OK under Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. With the Greens gone, the prospect of more ridiculous taxes greatly reduced. That's from Eamon in Kilkenny. Another one, Pat in Cork says, change is Fianna Fáil going into government with Sinn Féin or Fine Gael going into government with Sinn Féin. That's what change looks like. Uh, Fine Gael lost credibility when they started throwing silly promises around. That's from Dahi. Those, uh, you know, there were excessive promises towards the end of the campaign. Oh, yeah, Was the, that panic? The, well, they, 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 were throwing, uh, they were throwing promises around like confetti at a wedding. Actually, confetti is banned now, so pro probably uh, a, a bad metaphor. But some of the promises were silly and they were coming from all parties. And I think that might have been an act of desperation to try and lure people back to that particular party. Just a small point on Sinn Féin, the person said that Sinn Féin did have very credible policies. There were different policies, but they were credible. And to say that they're not credible uh, isn't correct. They, they do present a different ideological direction. But uh, Sinn Féin's policies over the past decade have become very solid in terms of mm -hmm. research and in terms of, you know, what they're presenting. They're not just throwing stuff out. They, there's always a good body of research behind what Sinn Féin does. If you agree with it or not, that's a different question. Do you believe that the, the election of Trump had any effect on this, that people were thinking that waters ahead are choppy? Well, in the last week of the campaign, both Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil put huge emphasis on this, on what had happened in America and the prospect of an economic shock uh, coming down the line. And the subliminal message was clear. You know, Donald Trump has been uh, elected. We do, not, we do not know uh, what's going to happen. And you should really put the trust in the people who are there already rather than in taking a punt uh, on, on an alternative led by Sinn Féin. And I'm sure that that had an impact on some voters who thought that things are OK at the moment. Uh, but if Trump is elected, uh, the fortunes of Ireland and my own personal fortunes uh, can plummet alarmingly. Uh, the people voted for the three big parties in Ireland. Therefore, the three parties should form a coalition. Until five years ago, it was unthinkable that Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil could share power. Uh, the issue there is you have a miserable, tiny opposition and that would not be exactly democratic. I mean, what kind of debates would you have in the Doyle? Uh, they would be pretty bad. I mean, the period between 2011 and 2016 when Fine Gael and Labour completely dominated the uh, Doyle and Fianna Fáil was in Perda, as it were, after its disgrace. Uh, it, it, the the uh, opposition in the Doyle wasn't very effective. 
in terms of holding the government to account. Mm. So I, I think that's the point. I, I mean, know. it is the duty of the opposition to oppose. It is. Not unreasonably oppose, but oppose. Yes, of course it is. And, and challenge government, who, whichever government is uh, in power. That's what they're there for. Um, an, an idea, uh, why don't they put polling booths in all third level institutions? That would drive real change. Yeah, that's, I mean, turnout is an issue and I think the Electoral Commission will have to look at it and I think that we will see... We're told we could be half a million people shy, that, that the it's overstated by half a million the, people. The register, absolutely. Yeah. The register needs to be looked at and also new, new ways for people to vote so that people can be in a position to vote by post, for example. If you look at the leader of the Social Democrats, Holly Cairns, she had a baby in, in Cork University Hospital on the day of the election. She wasn't in a position to vote for herself and her constituency because she was 50, 60 kilometres away from her constituency and she couldn't leave the hospital. So they, they for, for people who are in hospital... Now, we don't know do whether she put in a postal vote in, in anticipation of the happy day. Well, she could have done that, of course, yeah. And, and the thing about a postal vote is that it leads, lead, leaves it open to people to vote in advance of polling day. So I think the Electoral Commission will begin to look at solutions like that. Uh, some more of the text coming in... Um, the reason why people don't vote, no matter who's in power, is that nothing changes. I emigrated in 2007, came back last year, same issues. Nothing changes, only the masters, the political masters. Um, the people who say that if those people who didn't vote had voted, we would have a different government, clearly they don't understand the electorate. People don't vote for all sorts of reasons. There's no evidence to suggest that even if we had 100% of a turnout, that we would not have had the same result. In other words, the non-voters can come from all parties and have all sorts of reasons for not voting. That's, that's very true. And you, you have to go on the evidence that's in front of you. And the evidence on, in front of you is the people who have actually voted. In some countries, Canada, for example, it's compulsory to vote. By, by law, you have to vote. So you have to go into the polling booth. booth. You can go in and spoil your vote or leave the, the polling paper blank. But you have to perform uh, the exercise. I think that's probably a little bit too harsh. Uh, but there should be a campaign to encourage more people to vote. Will it affect the outcome? We, we don't really know because you're trying to second guess what people are yeah. thinking. And that's, as we've known from all the predictions we do before elections, that's a devilishly hard thing to do. Uh, Brian says, if Sinn Féin's policies were so credible, why didn't we buy into them? They were not uh, credible. Uh, this one, a uh, prediction, Michal Martin will be Taoiseach. Then in 2026, he will go for the job of UN Secretary General. He'll, he'll miss the park, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I, I don't know. In fairness to Micheál Martin, when he became Taoiseach in 2020, he came after a very bad election by Fianna Fáil. And for the first year and a half uh, of that particular government, backbenchers in Fianna Fáil kept on saying to me, by the time there's, he rotates to become Tánaiste, he will be gone and we will have a new leader of Fianna Fáil. And then they said he's going to be Tánaiste for a while, but he'll never be Taoiseach for a second time. So in fairness to him, he has managed to be a great survivor in terms of leadership. If you go back to 2011, uh, when he was leader of Fianna Fáil, people talked about him being the first leader of Fianna Fáil. Who never, never to be Taoiseach. Never yeah, to be Taoiseach. Well. Harry McGee, political correspondent with the Irish Times. Uh, thank you very much.